Welcome back. Well, as you can see, I'm trying to free myself from a cattail that is beating me in the face. Uh, yes, Audie is in a uh, cuddle crazy mood again today. No, 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 don't, don't, don't. Mm, all right. He's been a little impatient with me filming. And when he doesn't like my filming, he starts chewing on all the cords he can find. I can usually stop him before he does too much damage, either to the cord or to himself, because he'll just grab a cord and run with it. And if something comes sailing off a table as a result, well, you know, he got his way, didn't he? He's getting attention. Today, I thought we would go back and take a look at some more of the footage I got from Lutz Antiques when I was there last. There were some really, really beautiful things. And when I was choosing the piece that was coming home with me, I have to say, uh, there was a lot of competition, including one of the pieces we are going to see today. So, when we come back, we will get started. What are you up to? Well, one of the things I really love about Lutz Antiques is they change their stock remarkably frequently, considering the fact that they are in, um, in an industrial location in Carlisle. The area around them is some um, factories and warehouses, and it's, um, it's on Rittner Highway, which kind of tells you it's you know, not exactly a, an easy neighborhood location. Still, they turn their stock. So usually when I end up going in there, I can find something new and exciting that I haven't seen before. And that was the case with my last trip in. So let's start with a really, really interesting East Lake piece. Okay, we have a hall piece here. Now, I'm not going to be able to show it all to you in one frame because I can't back up far enough. Here we go. And this is East Lake Wonderland. All of the incised carvings, the Gothic motifs. Look at that. That is just... Oh, here we go. Here's our applied molding right here. Amazing East Lake piece. Gotta love it. Well, I was glad to have the opportunity to show a an East Lake Hall piece because these were very, very popular. In the Victorian era, slightly pre-East Lake. Remember, East Lake is the very end of the 19th century, and the Victorian furniture began pretty much in the middle of the 19th century. They had about a 30-40 year jump on East Lake. Hall pieces started to become popular. A lot of this had to do with um, different housing styles. Um, when we go back far enough, at least in the United States, when we go back far enough and we start looking at 18th century houses, unless you were really wealthy, the main room in your home was the kitchen. It was this large sort of um, a gathering room. This is where the cooking would be done, the eating would be done, there would be a big fire and this was just where the family convened. As we moved more close uh, to the modern era, we started to see changes. 
and spaces became more discreet. You would have a sitting room, you would have a kitchen, you would have a dining room. And of course, if you had a very elegant home, you would have several sitting rooms and several dining rooms and, you know, several. You'd have a breakfast parlor and a luncheon room and so on. That wasn't most of us. But one of the things that became popular as we moved into the Victorian era was a hall. Now, the, the foyer of a grand house had always been there. The, even in Gothic homes, there was an entry hall, this place where people went in to enter the house before they transferred to whatever room they needed to be in for whatever purpose they needed to be there. Private homes started um, copying this, and they would have an entry hall. And that's when hallway pieces became popular. And pieces like that East Lake piece, and the Victorians had their own versions thereof. They would have a mirror so you could check what you looked like before you left the house. They would have little hooks where you could hang your hat, your coat, whatever. And they often had a, a bench where you could sit down change from your shoes to your boots or things like that, and a little storage in the bench. So these items were very popular, and they tended to be tall and narrow. The reason for this is hallways in the average home were not really spacious. They were relatively small, and in the sort of standard house, you know, four on four, they shot right up the middle and there was the stairway in there. So they were sharing space with other functions. A hallway piece, uh, like the one that we just saw, also gave the homeowner an opportunity to put a very interesting, elegant, stylish piece of furniture right at the front door. So the minute you walk in, you would be seeing this, and you would be impressed. So uh, when the East Lake style became popular, the older Victorian hall pieces would be considered old fashioned. The new East Lake pieces would come in. And this was a trend that, that had a very limited life expectancy. Um, you start seeing hallway pieces like this in the early part of the 19th century, and by the early part of the 20th century, they're pretty much gone. Um, by the time the 20th century really got underway, a hallway was, it was viewed differently. Initially, your telephone was in your hallway. This is, that's the truth. Because people didn't understand telephones and in the mind of the average homeowner in the 1920s, you open the door, that's where guests come in, that's where you see strangers, so that's where you put your phone because that's a public space where the strangers are. You wouldn't put it in your bedroom or your kitchen, good heavens. So you see the changes in the philosophy about the uses of the various spaces in the home reflected in the furniture. 19th century, were it was all about impressing your guests as best you could. So even very modest homes would have a nice piece of furniture there. And then later in the 20th century, uh, certainly by the mid-century, those entry halls became almost obsolete. And you see mid-century homes without a hall. The door opens right into the living room. In fact, most modern houses constructed today, that's what you're going to see. The front door opens into the living room. That's the public space. It's as if there is no sense of... Um, keeping your guests at arm's length as there had been 
in the earlier days, and that was a thing. You know, people were just much more formal in their relationships, and they were not welcoming strangers into their private spaces. So I'm glad we got a chance to see that because it's a very typical piece of 19th century furniture for which we really don't have much in the way of 20th century counterparts. Um, the closest I have is a, a large floor vase that holds canes and umbrellas. Um, most other people might have like, you know, a little hall tree or something like that at their front door, perhaps a console table. But these big elaborate pieces are very much a 19th century piece, and they served a 19th century function. Okay, next up, this is one of the pieces I actually entertained buying when I was looking at the dental cabinet. And I'm sure you'll see why immediately. So let's take a look. And once again, I'm sort of trapped in a narrow aisle. So we're just going to have to take a look at this piece in stages. $3.95, very simple oak bookcase. I love these curves and it's this also. Let's see if I can show you that. Well, I'm not going to be able to show you the profile, but this is right here. This is curved as well. Beautiful piece. This is a fantastic price, by the way. Um, $3.95 for this. Hmm. Beautiful. And this is the quarter sawn oak graining. It's often called tiger oak. I'm sure you can see why. This piece appears to have been redone. It's got a sort of reddish tint to it. And that leads me to believe it may have been redone. It could in fact come from shellac. Shellac ages to a sort of orangey color. And that might be shellac instead of varnish. Yeah, remind you of anything? It's about 75% the size of this bookcase, made of the same era, the same kind of wood, um, the, uh, basically the same style, except this one is East Lake and it has that little East Lake, well, right over there, that little East Lake incised design across the front. But other than that, remarkably similar piece. And I really thought about getting that. Um, I thought it would make a fun restoration project. And then I realized I have a mission desk and the restoration projects for the, those two pieces would be virtually identical. Um, I would have simply cleaned it up, uh, did my best to preserve that old fumed finish. And that was a beautiful fumed oak finish and then um, it put a new uh, top coat on it. Probably all I would have done, but very tempting because the price is good and antique bookcases are always a fabulous investment. If you wanna get into buying antique furniture, I will tell you this right now, one thing that will always sell so if you ever change your mind, you'll always find a home for it. It's a bookcase. Old bookcases, boy, it's just, it's a thriving market. So I thought about it. I didn't go for it, but I was that close. Anyway, that piece, very much like this, a little simpler, sort of on a more modest scale, a bit smaller, but still. You got to know it's the kind of piece I love because it's what I've got. Um, next up, another of my very favorite styles. So here we go. And here we go with one of my favorite styles, Streamline Modern. This came out 
just after Art Deco. It was America's version of Art Deco. It's, uh, it's often called Art Modern. Inspired by the transportation industry and aerodynamics, they're calling it a waterfall uh, wardrobe. And you do hear the term waterfall applied a lot to these curved lines, see right here too. And especially when they used veneers like this, it did often appear to be rather like a waterfall. Let's take a look. Yep, we have two wardrobes on either side of the drawers. 525. Look at these definitely original handles. Very interesting. And these drawers. Notice the profile that creates. We have a little bit of marquetry here. A lot of very pretty veneer work. Well, I love Streamline Modern. I really do. Uh, I'm not going to say that that is a piece I would have purchased and brought home with me because it's not my favorite type of Streamline Modern furniture, but I do like it. I love the lines. I love the fact that they were designed to be aerodynamic. They, they were intended to make you stand in front of them and say, gee, I bet this thing could fly on its own. Um, they were so uniquely American. They were the embodiment of that sort of go, go American exceptionalism from the pre-war era. It was our version of Art Deco. And a lot of people would look at a piece like that and say, that's Art Deco. No, that is Streamline Modern. And I will tell you this, that it, it doesn't just take an expert to sometimes tell those pieces apart. Sometimes you will have equally qualified experts arguing about it because Streamline Modern was very heavily influenced by Art Deco. Their time periods overlapped significantly and you can see all of the deco in modern. You can see all of the modern in deco, but they are two separate styles. And those pieces, uh, they have become very, very collectible lately, but you can still get terrific deals on them. And what you find very often in Streamline Modern is pieces like the ones I just showed you for the bedroom. The ones that you can still find at the thrift stores and um, the yard sales are the smaller pieces, the bedroom nightstands. And you can pick those up for five or ten dollars at a Goodwill or a yard sale, and they will sell. So for those of you who are considering dealing in larger pieces, Never overlook Streamline Modern, because even if it's not your cup of tea, there are people out there who really, really want it and will pay top dollar for it, especially if it's unusual, if it's interesting, if it's in good condition. So that's a little selling tip or buying tip, as the case may be. Um, next up. Uh, oh, and I hope you notice I'm going from one extreme to another on this. Next up is a Hoosier cabinet. $9.95 Hoosier cabinet. Looks like it has been completely refinished. We have an enamel top right here. Very good condition. We've got a few nicks. Nothing major. These pieces would have had, uh, it would have been tin. It, it would have had a gray 
tone to it originally. It's been redone in black. Let's take a look at this. Okay, that's obviously been repainted. Um, this, let's see what we got here. Yeah, we have a little matching panel over here. Ah, 2007. This image is dated. 2007. So I think we can assume this one is also 2007. Hoosier cabinets were painted usually white, but they were originally painted. It's unusual to see a Hoosier cabinet that looks good. And this one does look good when it's been stripped back to the original wood. This one looks good because it's oak. Most of the time they used less expensive woods and often a combination of several different kinds of wood. So when you strip a Hoosier cabinet down, you very often just go back to repainting it again because in general, they were not meant to look like this. Nevertheless, nice job. Well, I thought that was uh, a very nice Hoosier cabinet. Overall, good condition. It is not what I would have done if I had that Hoosier cabinet. That's the truth. I would have done something in terms of a restoration that would have been more sympathetic with the original Hoosier cabinet. They were not like wood grain pieces. Oh, if they were, the wood grain was, was usually painted on. Um, and they had some really impressive wood graining techniques. Uh, you, you think that this sort of faux finish painting is something that we've only discovered recently. They have been doing that for hundreds of years and they had some remarkably good graining techniques. In general, when you see a Hoosier cabinet, it was probably originally painted white, sometimes green, because green was a hot kitchen color back in the early part of the 20th century, late part of the 19th century. These cabinets were a kitchen. Um, you had your flour dispenser, you had bins at the bottom that would hold your rice, your sugar, your potatoes, whatever. Uh, the nice enameled metal countertop for a work surface, those uh, roll top uh, doors would, that was your bread box. You could keep whatever you needed in there. And of course, a hundred years ago, people didn't need anywhere near so much in their kitchens because everything was made uh, from scratch. So if you had your flour, your sugar, your baking powder, you had dinner. But it was nice to see a piece that was, I wouldn't go so far as to say well restored. Well restored would have been painted as it had been originally but restored and didn't look dreadful in the oak. Um, the interior painting, that sort of uh, uh, blue milk paint, um, the, the uh, what were they? I don't know if that was like wallpaper panels or something. The pictures that were uh, pasted on the interiors of the doors now, it's, it's so far from authentic. Uh, the flower bin being painted that matte black, again, so far from authentic that I'm not going to say, oh, this was a wonderful, sensitive refinishing job. But for what it was, for what they were going for, I think it was nicely done. Certainly, they got all the original paint off it, which ordinarily is quite a challenge, 
because these things, they were old. They were used. They would get scratched and nicked. They would get repainted right over the scratches and the nicks. And cleaning all the paint off could be a real adventure. But it did give us an opportunity to look at a Hoosier cabinet, which was a very popular piece of furniture around the turn of the century. And we don't always see them in good condition. There are some at Bedford. Um, Paul has some. And if you have an interest in seeing a Hoosier cabinet that is still very much as it was originally, in other words, you look at this and you're basically seeing what it looked like in the farmhouse kitchen when it was new. I'd be more than happy to get some good shots of Paul's cabinets. And just let me know in the comments, because, you know, whenever I'm at Bedford, I always go up and check out Paul's cabinets. Not necessarily for the cabinets themselves, but for the goodies he keeps inside. So, let's move over to another piece. And this is, moving back to, this is Victorian again. Marble-topped Victorian washstand. And this does seem to be late Victorian, leaning a little toward East Lake. Um, actually leaning a lot toward East Lake. But the cabinet portion is very, very simple. The star of the show is this marble top. And the wash bowl would have lived here. And we have little stands for soap, for shaving gear. Wow, this, this is definitely a sweet piece. $265, mm, very good price. Well, the star of this show is that marble top. Uh, and it was a late Victorian piece. There were East Lake touches to it, um, enough East Lake so that I could pretty effectively date that piece at around 1890, 1895. But the marble tops, uh, they are so interesting. And the ones that sell, the ones that command the best prices are like this one, not just a plain marble top, but a marble top with a marble backsplash and maybe a few little shelves. Um, and uh, there was another one there that I'm sure I filmed and I will look for it and show it to you some other time. But that's the star of the show, the marble top. The cabinet below is relatively plain and simple. I, uh, I thought it was rather nice because it was the late Victorian moving into East Lake, and you know I love my East Lake, but it was really all about the marble. And keep in mind that the same cabinet, even with the same features on the top, if it were wood, would be considerably less valuable because today's market wants the old marble. So if you've got an old marble washstand, you've got a little mint in your pocket. All right, next up, again, totally different direction. We're going all over the place. This is a wonderful mid-century piece. Okay, how about something a little more modern? Mid-century dresser. Very, very pretty piece. We've got the drawers here. Uh, and they're smooth. Nice action on those pieces. Again, we've got drawers here as well, larger. Really interesting lines on this piece. The profile is somewhat reminiscent of some of those old empire pieces we've been looking at. Let's take a look at our price on this. Okay, 235 with optional mirror. And I assume that is the mirror behind us, but I don't know if that mirror actually goes with this piece. 
sweet peace. Oh, and on top, for the deco lovers, a little bit of art deco whimsy. Let's take a look at this. Pair of Roseville uh, Mastique Jardiniers and Pedestals. Eight fifty for the pair. Really, really nice. I have to admit, one of the things I like best about mid-century dressers is the way the drawers glide in and out so smoothly. Uh, they really were putting work into making drawer glides in the mid-century. Earlier, um, at, at, at earlier periods of time, a drawer was just a wooden box that slid in and out of a wooden frame. Sometimes they stuck, and sometimes, you know, you'd have to fidget to get them in and out, or one drawer would go in a little further than you wanted it to, or maybe stick out a little further. Boy, they had it down pat in the mid-century. And, oh, let me just quickly mention, when we go to work on the dental cabinet, we are going to talk about ways to make old drawers function according to modern standards. Because when we go to work on the dental cabinet, that's going to be a kitchen piece. And I'm not going to deal with sticky drawers. So, I know, with so many definitions for the word drawers, sticky drawers has so many possible meanings, doesn't it? Whoa. Anyway, our mid-century piece had really interesting lines. They were very, very creative when they were making furniture in the mid-century. There, there were touches that are just so reminiscent of empire. Um, things that, uh, it wasn't plain, ordinary furniture. If they could throw a little pizzazz in by rounding the front of a drawer or by recessing it a little, they did it. They were incredibly creative. And mid-century furniture, I, I love looking at mid-century furniture. And I have a friend whose home is mid-century. It's all mid-century furniture. Love looking at it. I couldn't live with it myself. It's not my style. But when I see pieces like this, I totally get why people would go for it. And then finally, of course, there were the Art Deco Jardiniers on top of that piece. Those are great. Oh, Jardiniers, by the way, for those of you who do not know, it is just a fancy French word for plant pot. Yeah, the French make everything sound so elegant, don't they? Those were outdoor pieces. Those pieces would have been on a porch or a patio or just freestanding in a backyard. Um, and of course, they are lovely. Um, oh, I know. I, yeah, every time I think about them, I think, gee, do you suppose I could work them into my yard? And the answer is no, I couldn't. Um, but I really do love pieces like that. Very, very art deco. And they, they just tell their own story. But the thing that I love is they were not interior pieces. These were not fancy pieces for the living room. These were intended to be functional, durable pieces for the front porch or the backyard. Lovely. Absolutely lovely. All right. So that was our tour of Lutz. And we won't be going back. The last time I was there, I took a huge amount of footage. And I'm going to try to do what I did today and mix it up so that we can talk about a whole variety of pieces, styles, um, and see if there's anything that resonates with you folks. All right. Looking forward to your comments, as always. And... I will see you all tomorrow. Have a great day.